began in ancient Greece when a man named Empedocles stuck out his hand and said, what's all this shit? He decided it was earth, air, water, and fire. He forgot beryllium and manganese, but it was pretty good since science hadn't been invented yet. <laughs> Pythagoras, the first man to call himself a philosopher, is best known for the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared plus c squared, which if you really had ever wanted to see again, you would not be a philosophy major. However, he was also the leader of a mathematico-religious cult that believed that eating beans was morally wrong, that odd numbers were masculine and even numbers feminine, and that the ideal state consisted of the height of an equilateral triangle times the square root of seven presided over by a constitutionally mandated infinite geometric sequence of lentils and chickpeas. <laughs> Zeno of Aaliyah argued in one of his many paradoxes that motion is impossible, sense of that which is in locomotion must arrive at the halfway stage before it arrives at the goal. That is, you can't ever make it from the couch to the fridge because first you have to go halfway and then halfway what's left and then halfway what's left with that and then you constantly divide something in half when you get an answer that's very, very, very small but not zero and therefore you can never arrive at the fridge. However, this view was challenged by both high school level calculus and America's staggering obesity epidemic. <laughs> in the Republic, Plato said the state should be run by philosophers. That's nice, I think it should be run by comedians. That and 495 will get me a mocha frappuccino. Moses Maimonides, in his guide for the perplexed, stro strove to reconcile Aristotelian philosophy and science with the teachings of the Torah. Maimonides created negative theology, the idea that one must only attempt to describe God through negative attributes. God doesn't exist. God, rather, is not non-existent. He is not one, but rather not plural. The point being that when people give God anthropomorphic qualities, they do not do justice to his greatness. One well, viewing Michelangelo's work in the Sistine Chapel might be tempted to disagree, but then again, a reading of God's cartoon appearances on The Simpsons might lead to the conclusion that Maimonides didn't fail to hit that not non on the nose. <laughs> St. Thomas Aquinas in Summa Theologica, a broad Dignagian tome covering Catholic thought, ranging from whether an angel moving from point A to point B passes with the points in between, whether it's ever just to charge interest on loans, also pondered whether several angels could be in the same place at once, finally deciding that they cannot. He was therefore confounded when in a 13th century royal fair, 55 of them emerged wings aflutter from a Volkswagen Jetta. <laughs> Descartes said, although I doubt, I cannot doubt that I exist, thus making knowledge possible. To prove it, he gave us the XY coordinate plane. Francis Bacon established and popularized an inductive method for scientific inquiry, often called the Baconian method. The Baconian method was later approved upon by George Foreman with a substantial reduction in saturated fat. <laughs> Hobbes came along with a social contract theory that said we had to give up all of our power to the sovereign in order to be protected. Locke came along and said, no, not all of our power, just some of our power. In summary, Hobbes equals Patriot Act, Locke equals ACLU. <laughs> Jeremy Bentham was utilitarian, discarding silly old rights and justice in favor of the principle of the greatest good for the greatest number, which Bentham argued can be determined mathematically via the hedonic calculus, for which one would pull out the old abacus and multiply the number of people experiencing pleasure times the intensity of the pleasure times the duration of the pleasure times the frequency of the pleasure times the likelihood of the experience of the pleasure again. Minus the number of people experiencing pain times the intensity of the pain times the duration of the pain times the frequency of the pain times the expectation of experiencing the pain again. And if you get a positive number, it's ethical, and if you get a negative number, it isn't. <laughs> a common criticism of the hedonic calculus is that it would therefore be moral to toss a Christian to the lions if enough Romans were around to enjoy watching it. <laughs> Many people, in fact, have no problem with this, although Bentham himself replied only insofar as to accuse his detractors of an abacus error. <laughs> Kant's categorical imperative says we should act as though women are actions to be a universal law. In other words, if everyone can't get away with it, you can't either. The problem with this is that if we were all Marilyn Manson, society would fall apart. As long as there's only one of him, we can enjoy his music with no repercussions. <laughs> Spinoza argued rather hilariously that no two substances can share the same nature, that substances can only be caused by similar substances, and that since no two substances are similar, therefore substance cannot be caused, therefore substance is infinite, therefore all things are but one substance, which is God, but not in the big great bearded man way, rather more in a God is a force made up of trees in nature kind of way, which creates the problem of what the fuck we're doing here, which Spinoza solved by saying that people and bacteria and tsunamis and everything else are merely modes or ways that God is. Because imagining humanity as a flush of arousal or a plaintive tear on God's cheek really cleared up that religion problem for everyone. <laughs> While Schopenhauer managed to be a vegetarian, opposed to slavery, and even sympathetic towards homosexuality, he nevertheless argued for the inferiority of women on all counts and compared marriage to, quote, grasping blindfolded into a sack of snakes, ho hoping to find an eel thus leading later thinkers to accuse him of conflating his philosophy with his failed hunt for pussy. <laughs> 
John Stuart Mill said that people should have free speech and also that women should be equal. While revolutionary in 1859, these ideas seem extremely obvious to us today, leading to the unfortunate conclusion that the price one pays for being right is seeming very boring in retrospect. <laughs> Bertrand Russell wrote a lot of really complicated stuff about math and then turned to the problem of definite descriptors, meaning that a bunch of other philosophers were perplexed by statements such as, the king of the unicorns loves Rice Krispies. If there is no king of the unicorns, or if there's more than one of them, then the statement can't be true or false, merely meaningless, which philosophers fucking hate. <laughs> one solution was to commit ourselves to the notion that there's a realm of non-existent entities we can refer to, which also bothered Bertrand Russell, but not so much J.K. Rowling. <laughs> Russell solved the problem by breaking down terms like the king of the unicorns into separate propositions, meaning that the king of the unicorns loves Rice Krispies actually contains the premises that there is an X such that X is the king of the unicorns and no other X is king of the unicorns and the king of the unicorns loves Rice Krispies. Therefore, if it turns out that there's no king of the unicorns, we merely have an argument that is cleanly false rather than messily nonsensical, which was a huge relief to a small number of analytic philosophers, a slightly larger number of five-year-old unicorn fans, and the Kellogg's marketing department. <laughs> Friedrich Nietzsche argued that we should worship really strong people. Turns out Hitler liked that idea a lot, which in philosophy we call a faux pas. <laughs> Adorno in the 1950s argued that while well, Marxism would have been fun, the moment at which socialist revolution would have been possible had passed and that advanced capitalism had become a force so rapacious as to quash or liquidate the forces that might once have brought about its collapse. This allowed Adorno, along with legions of rebellious college freshmen, to maintain their belief in Marxism without having to do anything at all about it. On another note entirely, Ayn Rand's objectivism was a philosophy touting laissez-faire capitalism, reason, individualism, hero worship, and even selfishness as a virtue. Her novel, Atlas Shrugged, portrays a world in which noble industrialists, disgusted by the estate tax, go on strike and retreat to a hidden mountain utopia while the torpid masses, aka the sniveling collectivist losers in the game of natural selection, die. Notably, the book's heroine and Rand's alter ego, alter ego Dagny Taggart, single-handedly runs an intercontinental railroad, makes all three of the world's most powerful men fall in love with her, and is apparently one of only two women in the entire world who deserve entry to the hidden free market utopia, thus leading to the popular series of capitalist fetish gangbang films, <laughs> Atlas Jizzed. <laughs> Michel Foucault, in Discipline and Punish, compared modern society to a panopticon, a prison in which we are watched at all times. He failed to anticipate that legions of underage girls on Facebook would have absolutely no problem with this. <laughs> and finally, Jean-Paul Sartre wrote that nothing has any inherent meaning, we have to make it up all for ourselves, and that was four years and $140,000 down the drain.